looking at the nature of God in our Wednesday classes, and uh, last time we were discussing, well, I said there are four aspects of God's nature. He is person, personal, personal, uh, spirit. He is a unity and tri-unity. And uh, tonight I want to begin with God's unity. The unity of God, and uh, I'd like for you to turn to Deuteronomy 6.4. Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So this speaks of God's unity. We're talking about his unity, then we'll look next at his uh, triunity. Now, the full meaning of God's unity or his oneness uh, has to be understood in light of what the New Testament has to say about it, not just the Old Testament revelation. This is a mistake of Israel, as well as the uh, liberals and so forth, who so stress God's oneness that they can't see Jesus. And so we have to understand God's unity or his oneness in light of the whole revelation, not just just Deuteronomy 6.4 or the Old Testament revelation, if for no other reason than Jesus came calling himself the Son of God. And so whatever his oneness means, it must include the fact that he has a son. And uh, he speaks of his spirit, so it has to include, whatever his oneness means, has to include God's spirit and God's son. And so in the light of full revelation, which the church has, then to say God is one means two things, basically. It means that he is the only God. First of all, God's oneness means that he is the only God. Uh, Isaiah 44, 68. God's unity or oneness means, first of all, that, that he is the only God. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, and the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and besides me there is no God. Isaiah 44, 6 to 8. Then secondly, God's oneness or unity means that he is one essence. One essence or nature, and that's John 4, 24, for God is spirit. There's only one divine spirit. Now, conversely, God's oneness does not mean that he's not triune, because the scriptures show that he is. So whatever his oneness means cannot exclude the fact that he has more than one manifestation. In fact, we know it to be Father, Son, Holy Spirit. To say that God is one does not mean that God that the one God cannot manifest himself eternally as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus in John 10.30 said, I and my Father are one. And you take the Jesus only people, take that verse and none, no other revelation. And so they, like the Jews, are confused over what oneness means or what the unity of God means. Because Jesus in John 17, John 10, 30, he said, I and the Father one. John 17, Jesus prays to the Father in heaven. So very obviously, when he said, the Father and I are one, he doesn't mean they're one personality. I avoid the word person because it leaves the wrong, wrong connotation, as we'll see Later, I don't know if we'll get to it tonight, but we'll see that God in Scripture is never called a person. We are persons, but God is not a person. God is spirit. He's a personality. He's a personal being, but he is as different from us as you can be. He is spirit and we are man. God is not a man, the Scriptures say. So to say that God is one means that there is a unity of nature or essence, spirit, but this does not exclude other manifestations of the one spirit. And this is the mistake of the Jew. They, the Jew stumbles over the Old Testament revelation. 
he limits revelation to the Old Testament, and the Old Testament does not intend to be the full revelation of where we'd never have a New Testament revelation. And so the Old Testament revelation is, uh, of God is Deuteronomy 6.4, and there's a reason for that, as we'll discover in a moment, why God insisted for them to stress Deuteronomy 6.4. Now, his oneness, then, is a oneness of essence or nature. There are no other gods. There's one divine being, one divine spirit, one divine essence, God. There are no other God spirits, no other divine spirits, no other gods. That's what oneness means in the Old Testament. In fact, the Jews took the right meaning of Jesus' statement in John 10:30, when he said, I and the Father are one, and they went on to say, you make yourself God. They took the right interpretation of what he was saying. That's right. You see, but they couldn't handle that on the basis of Deuteronomy 6.4. That is, those couldn't because other Jews who believed didn't stumble at it. They didn't, they like uh, I have so often said, didn't try to figure out what they were experiencing. They just enjoyed it. It's like with the baptism. You try to figure out what language you're speaking, God will take that one away from you. So God's oneness means that he's one essence, one divine being, but he doesn't want us to canonize the number one. God is not one like the number one. That's to miss it. It's not a mathematical oneness, it's a qualitative oneness. It's not a oneness number one, it's a oneness of essence. One divine spirit. And it's a unique kind of oneness because it belongs only to him. <clears throat> when, the, when the scriptures say that, uh, speak of one man, it doesn't mean there aren't other men. But when the scriptures speak of one God, it does mean there are no other gods. So his oneness is unique. Now monotheism is taught in Deuteronomy 6.4, and of course it's a stumbling block to the Jew with respect to receiving Christ. But it is true, monotheism, we trust you know what that is because we gave you all the various isms when we started to study the doctrine of God. Monotheism is the biblical view, Old Testament view. It's the New Testament view. Monotheism is true, and its emphasis in the Old Testament was to, to uh, its purpose was to wean Israel away from idolatry. She came out of polytheism in Egypt. They worshipped everything, made gods of everything, four-footed beasts, sun, man, everything. And so God's, God's stress upon his oneness was to wean them away from idolatry so they would not uh, uh, follow the... In fact, as we read in the book of Acts, they brought some of their gods out with them. Some of the Israelites did, so they were polytheistic. But his oneness, you see, simply means there are no other gods. It does not mean that Christ is not God. But there is one essence, one being, one nature, but different personalities, a tri-personality in the oneness of God. Now, I think that's sufficient to understand what oneness is, and uh, we can come now to the uh, doctrine or study of the Trinity, or the triunity of God is a better term. Now, the doctrine of the triunity of God logically follows the study of his unity because we see in the nature of the one God there are seen in Scripture three distinct personalities revealed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is a revelation. You don't get it uh, You don't get it from just the Old Testament. You have to have the New Testament revelation. In fact, Israel didn't get her uh, understanding of God's oneness by reason. She didn't philosophize about it and discover God is one. He revealed the oneness of himself. As Deuteronomy 6.4 taught them to say, Hear, O Israel, our Lord is one Lord. See, that's right before they go into Palestine. He was teaching them to give up their other gods. But in the one oneness of God, there are three distinct personalities. And I'd like to give you four or five introductory observations about God's triunity, which will be the basis of other 
things we say. Now, this is, a, this is a big question. We'll probably be on it for two or three weeks. The triunity of God. First of all, the doctrine of the triune nature of God is a revelation of the Word. You can't get it from general revelation or nature. You remember we studied general revelation. For example, Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. Romans 2 says, God reveals himself in nature. But we said when we taught you that, there are certain things that can come only by special revelation, and this is one of them, the triune nature of God. You see, man the sinner can look at creation, look at nature, and see God, but he can't see Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That takes special revelation. So the triune nature of God is a revelation of the Word, first of all. Secondly, the term Trinity that uh, every Christian so freely uses uh, doesn't occur in the Bible. So the term that we're talking about doesn't occur, but don't let that disturb you, neither does atonement. <laughs> and that's the basic message of the Christian church, Old and New Testament. Word atonement doesn't occur in the Old or New Testament. But I haven't seen that bother anybody. Now the anti-Trinitarians like Herbert W. Armstrong and the Unitarians and so forth, they like to cite that fact, well, Trinity, the word Trinity is never used in the Bible. But there are a lot of terms the church accepts that are not used in the Bible. And uh, I don't especially use the word Trinity anyway, though I don't avoid it particularly, but the triunity of God, his triune nature, T-R-I-U-N-E, the triunity of God is really a more accurate term. But uh, there are better words than atonement in the Bible, because if... Uh, the word is in your English Bible. Don't misunderstand. It's not in the Hebrew and the Greek. There are better words in the Hebrew and Greek than atonement because you tell a sinner that's never heard the gospel, Jesus is an atonement for you, he'd say, well, what's that? That's right. yeah. So you go ahead and explain atonement now if you want. There's no agreement on even what the word means. So uh, there are better terms in the Bible, like the Old Testament, those of you who are taking Hebrew, it's kafar, you've already got it, and a kofar, kofar is a covering. And so what the, blood of, what the blood does of the animal and the blood of Christ, it covers our sins. So what he provided, if it had been accurately translated in the English versions, uh, the animals were giving us a covering for our sins, and Christ gives us a covering for our sins. His blood covers it over from the sight of God. God can't see them. That says a lot more to me than atonement, because I don't know what atonement means. I have to look it up in the dictionary, and then even then, uh, there's no agreement. Of course, we know theologically what we mean by it, but you have to explain it. And why explain words if you don't have to? And there are a lot of words that are used that, uh, well, a lot of people you run around say, well, have faith. Have faith in God. Have faith in Jesus. And they'll say, well, what's faith? Well, we've got a definition of that in the Bible, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Say faith is the substance of what you hope for. It's the evidence of what you can't see. So uh, terms are no better than your ability to explain them. Trinity is all right if you can explain it. A better term is triune or triunity. Uh, triunity. But it's all right that it doesn't occur because we, we don't canonize the words that are not in the Bible, like Trinity, and that isn't the solution to the question anyway. The answer to the Jew, the answer to the Unitarian who, says, who denies the Trinity, the triune nature of God, is not whether or not we can find the word Trinity in the Bible, but that God is what he reveals himself to be. And he reveals himself as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And we don't have to figure it out. We believe it. And so it's a question of faith. Then why study it? Well, we'll point that out to you tonight because men are sinners and some are deceivers or false prophets and false teachers always perverting the simple, plain truth 
And so the church had to come to the place where it settled all the doctrinal questions, the things you believe in your church. If you're an evangelical, conservative, orthodox Christian, that's what you should be. If you're not, why, it's questionable whether you are a Christian. Then things you take for granted weren't taken for granted in the first four centuries. They had to be ironed out by the church. Because somebody would rise up in the church and start saying something like they didn't then, but they are now. Jesus became a sinner for us and had to be born again. See, well, they'd come against that right away. And so when somebody said God is not triune, see, they accepted that fact. They didn't need a doctrine on it. Then they had to meet and say, what do the scriptures teach? And so this is how these theological terms like atonement, trinity, and the doctrines that are taught by the church are supposed to be taught, that are in the creeds at least, it's how they came about. See, the Bible is not a systematic theology. It's a book reporting, recording revelation. But God expects us to get in here and to build a systematic study of any truth like the divine nature of Christ. The Old Testament prophecies concerning it and the New Testament revelation confirming it. He expects you to do that. You should want to do it as a Christian. I didn't have to, anybody have to have anyone twist my arm. I had all I could do with college, seminary, churches, uh, pastoring, and that sort of thing, but I still kept me an independent study going out of theologies. And that's how I developed a theology, a workable theology of the Bible, is because I certainly didn't get it in the seminary. They taught contrary to what we believe or what I teach you and what the Bible says. And um, I assume any Christian would want, you know, want to do that, not just to parrot back what somebody said because his, it's in his church creed. So that's the second thing. The term Trinity is not in the Bible. That doesn't mean anything. We'll use the term triunity anyway. Thirdly, the tri-personality of God is not tritheism. Tri-personality of God is not tritheism. That means three gods. The Jews said, you don't have a trinity, you have tritheism. But the tri-personality of God is not tritheism. While there are three personalities, we insist there's only one spirit God. There's only one God. Fourthly, the three personalities, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the scriptures show to be equal and eternal. Now, these are just some basic truths we're giving you before we start the study of it. They're equal and eternal. All of those questions were disputed in the early church by false teachers. Jesus is not eternal. Holy Spirit is not equal with God. Those were things they were saying. Fifthly, and uh, this won't help you too much, but you have to say it, there are no earthly analogies to express adequately the truth of the triunity of God. <laughs> we'll do the best we can, but we're not going to try to explain God. If we did, he wouldn't be God. He is a mystery and always will be. You'll have all of eternity for him to reveal more and more of himself. But there are no earthly analogies to express the truth of the Trinity. In fact, there are no analogies. And uh, all of these analogies that you get in your theological books and studies are not the answer. They're just attempts as we get down to the biblical formulation of the doctrine of the Trinity. You see that there are many examples and you think they're helping you until you stop and think and say, well, I still don't know more any more than I did. Somebody said God, and they don't mean disrespect to say this, it's like an egg with three yolks. One egg, three yolks, you know, if you try to figure how one God and three persons are three personalities. But God isn't an egg, and, uh, you know, I mean, that. there are no earthly analogies. You haven't really said much. Maybe that'll help you, I don't know. See, to see how three can be one. But you see, the only problem with that, you've got three yolks. And you could easily make three eggs out of that. 
You've got three eggs in one shell. You don't have... And God isn't that. There's one spirit. It's the Father, it's the Son, the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus can say, I... He didn't say, I'm the Father, but he said, I and the Father are one. Philip, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then he'd pray to the Father in heaven. Don't try to figure it out. <laughs> And he said to Philip, when I go, I'll send the Spirit, and that'll be me and the Father dwelling in you. <laughs> so that three eggs doesn't really help. Uh, one egg with three yolks doesn't help. So there are no earthly analogies. Some of them are a little better than that, and I'll give them to you later, but uh, uh, there, there, there can nothing adequately be nothing adequately express the invisible hiddenness of God. He reveals himself in Jesus, and that's it. No man has seen God. No man would even know he exists except Jesus revealed him. And I don't mean New Testament. I mean in Old Testament. Colossians 1 said that was Jesus creating Genesis 1.1. And that angel of the Lord in the Old Testament was the pre-incarnate Jesus appearing as an angel. So the only, only thing that God has ever said to this world, he said through Jesus. So we can't, uh, we can't figure him out. He will reveal more of himself to those who will pay the cost. But uh, you'll never figure out God. It's beyond human comprehension. Uh, by analogy, try to explain to your cat or dog or your pony or horse about yourself. Watch the response. <laughs> And if God tried to explain himself, that would be our response. I'm not being facetious or anything else. That's, he's so far beyond. His way is his wisdom. So far beyond what he could even communicate to us. And some people believe, and I'm not sure it isn't true, that what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12 wasn't that he, it was not lawful for him to report what he saw. He said it was impossible. There were no words. I know a brother said he fasted for 40 days, 40 nights. 40th day, God gave him a revelation on the Godhead. What is it? He said, I can't communicate. There are no words. It's a revelation. It's in here. You believe that's possible? God can show you something you couldn't tell your mother, brother, sister, husband, wife? <laughs> I think he showed me some things I can't communicate to everybody, and it's not necessarily that they're that profound, but uh, there's just that much gap between what you may know and someone you try to witness to about some things you've experienced. They'll have to get there the way you did, through the trials, through the experiences. Uh, try to explain faith to a person, uh, deeper life, uh, abundant life to a person who just got saved. <laughs> abundant life. He said, I thought I just got it. <laughs> well, so uh, we come now to the historic formulation of the doctrine. The historic formulation of the doctrine. You'll learn more theology by this systematic approach in a year than you could learn on your own studying in 20 years or sitting just listening to preaching for 50 years. <laughs> it's, it's true that, uh, that what we're going to be showing you about the doctrine of the Trinity uh, has come through deep agony and searching and working it out through the Scripture by the saints of old and those that have followed them who have tried to understand what God wants us to know. But the doctrine of the Trinity, like the doctrine of the deity of Christ, the two natures of Christ, the deity of the Holy Spirit, the personality of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of the Trinity was formulated by the early church from the teachings of the Bible. And the clarification of this truth of the doctrine of the Trinity, like those others I mentioned, by the church councils arose as a result of the controversies that arose. 
within the church itself. False prophets, false teachers, Paul said, when I leave will rise up right from your own midst and teach heresy, false doctrine, and draw away disciples to themselves. So the doctrine of the Trinity, like the doctrine of the deity of Christ, virgin birth of Christ, eternity of Christ, the two natures of Christ. See, only Christ has two natures. Nobody else in the universe. The two natures of Christ, the deity of the Holy Spirit, personality of the Holy Spirit, the total depravity of man, salvation by grace. We can go on and on and on. These things were hammered out by the church in the first four centuries. Doctrines are in the creeds of the Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran churches, for example, and other evangelical churches, were hammered out in the first four centuries by the church councils because heretics, false teachers, sometimes were bishops of big churches. The, the, when I say bishop, I mean elder, a leading elder, like Arius. His name will be coming up all the time. Arius, in the 4th century, denied the deity of Christ. He was a well-known churchman. He said, Christ was not God. Christ was not equal with God. Christ was not the same essence as God. That became known as Arianism. And many people followed him. Others denied the deity of the Holy Spirit, personality of the Holy Spirit, salvation by works began to creep in, that sort of thing. Baptismal regeneration is quite early in the church, the teaching, false teaching on it. See, the early church was faced with the problem of regarding, uh, uh, of how to regard the truth of the Trinity or Triunity of God because there was no systematic formulation of that truth. They just read the Word of God. They saw He was Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And, of course, you wouldn't have a doctrine or a creed on a subject like that. We knew that Jesus was Son of God. They knew Jesus was Son of God. They had a Father in Heaven that sent Him. And uh, the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. And why do you need a theology about what's obvious and what you've experienced? They received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They received Christ in their heart, and they knew they had the Father. But heretics arose, and so they had to, as great heresies would arise, they had to call together the leaders of the churches of the world in those early centuries. They don't do that anymore. It'd be good if they did, maybe, if, if they would listen to somebody that had the revelation. But I don't think they would. Someone said, why don't... Or would you be opposed to straightening out some of the leaders on this air of submitted body? I said, I don't feel that's my calling. <laughs> and it would take an hour of your time to tell you why. But basically, I don't think they would listen. You see, you've got a different situation. In the early church, you had, uh, say, the first couple of centuries, you had the apostles, first century, some of them, uh, like John came right up to the end of the first century, the apostle John, before he died. Then you'd have the disciples of the apostles, and some of them would be apostles. So the first couple of hundred years, you have pretty tight control upon the churches in the sense if, if error crept in, they could begin right away to deal with it. But after three, four hundred years, you've got churches pretty much becoming independent from other churches, you see, and churches are independent of one another. They should be. One should not be able to dictate to the other, but we should be able, ideally, to be able to meet together and settle questions and have fellowship and so forth, but you can't do that anymore, except if you're a Baptist, you can do it with other Baptists, and if a Baptist gets the Holy Spirit, he's put out of the association of churches. This happens, so... Um, and a charismatic, who's he going to fellowship with? Well, he could fellowship with other charismatics, but... And there, there's a measure of this that goes on, but there's no worldwide control of things. That is, influence and apostolic authority that can say to a church or a work, you're off, like Paul could rebuke Peter, another apostle. And he could write all of these letters to churches like Corinth, 
and so on, uh, to uh, rebuke error and heresy creeping in. You see you had error creeping in, right? Uh, a lot of these epistles show that, Gnosticism and so forth. Uh, I could point out a half a dozen errors that they're writing about. Like First John, there were those who were saying that Jesus didn't actually die. He just appeared, he just appeared to, because God can't die. Sounds, you know, pious, religious, and people who are not grounded in the Word, they, they get caught on things like that. Well, that's right, God couldn't die, so as long as he appeared to die, then that satisfied, you know, the demands of God. And so we're today to the place that we can't meet together and settle questions. Now, certainly, as far as I know now, I'd be willing and doesn't mean I can't be taught things. Certainly I can, but after all, if a person spends 23 years in the ministry and um, works to get as many degrees as I have, and degrees don't mean anything, it just reflects the study I've done. That's the only reason I mention it. And has spent the hours, 16 hours a day, seven days a week, for years in studies. Uh, you get to the place where you do know some things. Doesn't mean you can't be <clears throat> doesn't mean you can't be taught. So as far as I know, I'd be willing to meet with leaders, charismatic leaders, and discuss some of these things where they're off. And I I trust that doesn't sound like, you know, that well, we've got the truth and they have it. That's not what I said. But when they're off, they're off. And I don't feel hear Paul going around apologizing, not that I'm comparing myself to him, for the fact that uh he could write letters and show people where they were off, but he was a theologian. We're back to that again. Not many people are theologians. Who's going to take the time to study the doctrine of the Trinity? Therefore, because they don't, that's why some people get off on the question of the Trinity. Because they, it's in their creed, they say, I believe it, and then somebody will come along with a subtle little error. You see, the devil slipping in a little of his deception. It'll sound pretty good. The first thing you know, they've got a teaching on it. They take a scripture like, submit yourselves to one another, and the first thing you know, you, if they tell you to sell your house, you've got to do it. I mean that literally. And uh, the fact, we've got one verse that says, Christ became sin for us, and we became the righteousness of God in him. They forget all the other revelations, so they make Christ a sinner on the cross and uh, try to make every verse or every word say things that they're not saying. The Bible isn't just 2 Corinthians 5.17, it's Genesis to Revelation. And a person who is not deeply grounded in the theological studies of the Bible can very easily get off on things that are very subtle distinctions, but they're very dangerous heresies. And it's always heresy when you, when you pervert the doctrine of Christ. If you're going to pervert something, and I don't recommend you do, I'm saying this to make a point. If you're going to pervert something, get on the doctrine of church organization or baptism or something. Stay away from the deity of Christ or the person of Christ because this is heresy. And all the major heresies and errors of the early church pertain to Christ. They tried to make him less than God, not eternal, mere man, adopted by God, that sort of thing. And uh, I don't recommend anyone hold any error, but you'll notice that the most dangerous ones deal with, with Christ. I'd like to, uh, in this introductory study, to give you four important church councils to keep in mind uh, because, as I say, these questions in the early church had to be ironed out by the church leaders. Leaders of the church from all over the world would meet to settle questions of doctrine and practice. And generally, these would be, these would be councils which would meet in order to come to a scriptural position concerning some error or heresy in the church. Now, we've got that right in the book of Acts, Acts 15. This is not something new that the churches began to do in the first four centuries, right? At the time of Peter and Paul, you have the first church council that ever met, Acts chapter 15, and we've studied the book of Acts, so uh, I'm sure you're familiar enough with it to know what happened there. It's a controversy over whether or not Gentiles had to be circumcised and keep the law. 
So they had to establish a position. What was the scriptural position concerning Gentiles who were saved? Did they have to become Jews? Acts 15 says, Certain men came down from Judea, which taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Verse 5, There rose up a cer certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed. You see, they were Christians, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. You know what the decision was? Verse 19 uh, verse 9, that we put no difference between us and them, for God has put no difference between us and them. He's purified the Gentiles' heart of the faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Then verse 19, wherefore my sentence is. James is the leading elder of the church, so he's speaking for the rest of them, the apostles and leaders. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble them not, which from among the Gentiles have turned to God, but that we write to them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, from blood. And so there's your first church council. They didn't have any decision on this. It never occurred to them what would a Gentile do, because up to this time, the only person who could ever be saved would be a Jew because of all the obvious reasons. Only he had the means of atonement, sacrifice. And so here they came to a definite position of the church. Now I'd like to give you four important councils. The councils did not establish doctrine. They only officially stated the church's position on scriptural truths. No council could ever establish doctrine. It's already established in the Bible. But they had to get together and say, now what does the Bible say on this question? So first, the first is the Council of Nicaea. And the reason we have to look at these councils first because when you see what they dealt with, then you'll understand better the doctrine of the Trinity and the deity of Christ and the personality of the Holy Spirit. That's 325 A.D., Council of Nicaea. That counts, council, not, I won't give you anything but what it decided. Now, of course, there are other things that they dealt with, but basically the official position of the church was Jesus is divine, the Son of God. Now, if you might wonder why they'd have to declare that truth, well, when you got a lot of churches saying that he isn't divine by the result of teaching of false teachers, then somebody's got to take an official position. And that's why when we hear things like Jesus became a sinner, submitted body, and ultimate reconciliation, then it comes forth from this pulpit the errors of those things. But we don't have to preach against them until somebody starts believing the wrong thing. So Orthodox Christians already believed Jesus was divine, but there were those who were saying, no, he was adopted by God. He was just a good man and still called themselves Christians. And you'll always find just mobs of people follow any false teaching for some reason. So the decision was he was not created, not adopted. Council of Nicaea, not created, not adopted. He's the eternal, divine Son of God. Then the second council was the Council of Constantinople. That met in 381 A.D. Now when I say second council, I mean second of the four I'm going to give you. There were a lot of councils, but these decided big, eternal questions. Or that is to say they gave an official pronouncement on the biblical teaching. These were all the church leaders from all over the then known world. And this council de declared its pronouncement, the Holy Spirit is divine. Because there were teachers who, who uh, began to teach that he was created. So the Holy Spirit is divine, not created, not impersonal was the decision. Not created, not impersonal. He's not just a influence, abstract 
principle, but a person, personal. Then the Council of Ephesus met in 431. Council of Ephesus, 431. That affirmed the total depravity of natural man. The total, total depravity of natural man. Man is incapable of moral obedience to God. Salvation is by grace and not works. You see, this is the early church position, and those denominations and churches today, most of them don't believe that. They don't believe man is incapable of moral obedience. They think he's just a strayed child and needs to be corrected by education, religious education brought back. But the early church taught the total depravity of natural man. Now that's a big question among denominations, big argument. There are those who uh, will argue tooth and toenail because of pride. They don't want to admit they were totally without hope, without God, and God reached down and saved them. They want to like to feel like they cooperate with God. Then the Council of Chalcedon. Council of Chalcedon in 451. And this council affirmed that Jesus Christ has two natures in one person. Jesus is one person with two natures, one personality with two, two natures. Those natures are human and divine. Without, uh, without trying to draw a map there, I guess it's not that important, but all four of these are right at the tip, if you have a map in your Bible, at the tip of Asia Minor, if you want to know where these places are, I don't know what kind of a Bible you've got. I don't even have, yeah, there's one. But Asia Minor is Turkey today. You see there, uh, you got a map like the one up on the board, which is covered up. But this tip out here, and all of those are right in here, where those councils met. The tip of Asia Minor. Chalcedon, Nicaea, Ephesus. In Constantinople. Now then, why uh, study doctrines that have already been settled so many centuries ago? Why study truths that have, uh, where the church has already answered the false teachers and the heretics for the simple reason that these false teachings keep arising? Right here in this country. Where do you think the Unitarians started? You know, you don't have to go back, but... Uh, couple of hundred years, you've got Unitarianism, you've got Universalism, you don't have to go back but a few years and you run into liberalism and modernism, all which deny the deity of Christ, personality of the Holy Spirit, the very things that were denied here in these early centuries, and the church had to hold these councils. And so uh, you, you have to know what the Bible teaches about what you say you believe, because if you don't know the biblical basis for the truths you affirm, then you can, or at least it is possible for many to be deceived, and many have and are being deceived by a lot of false teaching. If you take Herbert W. Armstrong, he denies the Trinity, you see, he makes much of that. Take unity in Christian science, they deny the deity of Christ, blood atonement. You take many uh, so-called evangelical denominations to die, deny the total depravity of man. And they get man cooperating with God in his salvation. You've got all of Roman Catholicism, which says if a man says that he's justified by faith without works, let him be accursed. That's just the opposite of what the Bible teaches. So you've got all of these heresies constantly confronting you. Now we come to the, first of all, before we look at the scriptural teaching on the triune nature of God, the triunity, we want to look at the heretical formulation of the doctrine. And there were three kinds of heresy in the early church that affected the doctrine of the Trinity. There were three kinds, and we've got, we've got it still with us today. It comes up under different names, like Armstrongism, that sort of thing. 
See, Armstrong denies the personality of the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the heresies concerning, the early heresies concerning the Trinity. There are three kinds of heresy. That which, let me mention them, then we'll deal with them one at a time. That which denied the distinctions between the persons of the Godhead. And secondly, that which uh, emphasized uh, that which emphasized the distinction, one which denied the distinction, one which emphasized the distinction between the persons of the Godhead, and a third heresy of the early church denied the deity and personality of the Holy Spirit. You see, in any case, you're, you're dividing up God and making Jesus or the Holy Spirit less than God, so in effect you're denying the Trinity or the triune nature of God. So we look first of all at that heresy of the early church that these councils, various councils answered, that heresy that denied the distinction between the persons of the Godhead. And I'm using persons now, and I'll explain what the biblical term is later, because it's so hard to keep from using words that uh, are common to us and the Bible doesn't call God a person, but we'll have to stay with some terms, I suppose, like inspiration. We've already explained that, where the Bible says God breathed all Scripture. Uh, when we say inspiration, then we know that we mean that. Now, this uh, view, which denies the distinction between the personalities of the Godhead, is called, and don't be afraid of the terms, because everybody has to learn them, they go deeper with this. That is modalistic monarchianism. <laughs> In college and seminary, all you can do is get time to write them down. They don't apologize for the terms. They don't even bother to spell them. And uh, it's also called Sabellianism. You need both terms. Modalistic monarchianism or Sabellianism. Now, when we explain them, you'll see the terms are not uh, that formidable anyway. Modalistic, and I'll explain it in more detail, but I just want to show you what the term means. Modalistic means that God appeared in various modes as Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and monarchianism is from a word... <laughs> Uh, monarcha, which means ruler, and so that means God, of course. And modalistic monarchianism means that God, the ruler, appeared in successive modes: first as Father, then as Son, then as Holy Spirit. And that He's not three eternal manifestations, but that He just appeared successful, successively in those modes. It's called modalistic monarchianism or Sabellianism. Now a man by the name of Praxius started all. He was the first heretic on this. P-R-A-X-E-A-S, Praxius. Praxius in the second century stressed monotheism or the unity of God to the point that he denied any distinctions in the Godhead. He denied any distinct distinction between the persons of the Godhead. He stressed the unity of God so much that he allowed a deceiving spirit to get in, come in. And so he got up one day and declared God existed in three temporary modes. That's his teaching. God existed in three temporary modes in chronological order. Now the emphasis is upon chronological, as you'll see later. God existed in three temporary modes in chronological order. Would you believe that people still believe that today? Sure, the Jesus-only people. This is where you see you can trace oneness people right back to this first heretic in the second century. This is where they get it. Jesus is the Father. The Father is Jesus. The Holy Spirit is Jesus. Jesus is the Holy Spirit. And uh, Jesus was the Father in the Old Testament. He was Jesus in the Gospels, and he's the Holy Spirit sent to the church today. You can trace their heresy right back. 
And there are a lot of oneness people around. So this is where they get the name, modalistic monarchianism. God existed in three temporary modes in chronological order. First, he manifested himself temporarily as creator and lawgiver. That would be the Father. Then, secondly, he, created, he, he manifested himself temporarily as redeemer. That would be Jesus. Then he manifested himself as life giver and sanctifier. That would be the Holy Spirit. Temporarily, in all three modes. The Father of the Old Testament, the Son in the Gospels, and he was and he is Holy Spirit in Acts and the rest of the New Testament dispensation. Now modalistic monarchianism came to be called Sabellianism. That's what we put up here, Sabellianism, because Sabellius was a teacher in the early church who popularized this doctrine, and so it came to be called by his name. It was never really called modalistic monarchianism it came, or praxism. It came to be called Sabellianism. And he said the one eternal God existed successively. You know, that's in succession, one after another. The one eternal God existed successively in three forms, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the oneness people are Sabellians. They, they hold the heresy of Sabellianism. Now we criticize that. I'll give you three criticisms about it, and then we'll stop there and take up next time. Such of you would leave heaven empty for the whole time Jesus was on earth, about 33 years. We'd have the universe without a sovereign ruler on the throne for 33 years. That's unthinkable to me. I'll tell you one thing, it would have happened, the devil would have taken over. So can you imagine heaven empty? If, if Jesus is the Father, you see, the Father is Jesus, and when the Father became Jesus, heaven was empty. It had no one on the throne. Secondly, it denies a real incarnation. You know what incarnation is? That Jesus, be, the, the eternal Son, became a man, and he remains a man, glorified. God, man, glorified. So that denies a real incarnation if God exists in three temporary successive modes. Christ's human personality ceased to exist when he became the Holy Spirit. So we have no Jesus in heaven now. We've only got a Holy Spirit. So it denies a real humanity to Jesus. And Hebrews 1 and 2 stresses humanity as him identifying himself with the human race so he could uh, suffer for us and die for us. And thirdly, it contradicts the scriptural teaching scriptures plainly teach to the contrary. It ignores those passages where you see the three personalities together, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We have passages where they're together. It ignores those passages where Jesus prays to the Father, where he says he'll send, he and the Father will send the Holy Spirit. It ignores those passages where Jesus is said to be sitting at the right hand of the Father, and on and on and on. You wonder if they ever read the Bible when they come up with these. In fact, the oneness people and Jesus only, who are the modern-day Sabellians, modalistic monarchians, I always am amazed when I read their literature, like one book is Jesus in the Godhead or is the Godhead in Jesus. And he got this revelation in 1920. That's how old the Jesus only movement is, friends, 1920. But it's the same old deceiving spirit that was working back through practices and Sabellians. And as I read the writings, you know, they take scriptures like, I am the Father of one, and ignore the, a verse maybe that will follow where Jesus then turns right around and prays to the Father. Just like they'd never read anything but the one little verse they wanted to build a church on. Someone have a question? All right. I had an argument with the Pentecostal preacher in our town. He said it was like a river. And, uh, out 
Well, no one can read the Bible and come up with Sabellianism. Amen. Yeah, when did you ask me at first? I didn't. No, I was wondering if all this contrast is what, what the Baptists believe. Oh, they're dispensationalists? Well, I don't see any relationship. They don't tie the Trinity. And of course, the Baptists are not dispensationalists. Fundamentalists are. And you've got some Baptist fundamentalists, if that's what you mean. But that most Baptists, by far, at least 90% of them are anti dispensational. But uh, to answer your other question, I don't see any relationship between uh, dispensational aspect of the Trinity and dispensationalism as such.